Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 223, Mounds of Minis. Fantasy games with a ton of miniatures. I'm Sean, and here with me, the Tabletop Bellhop, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. We record these shows live on Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern on Twitch, and we'd love it if you joined us. So welcome to the second part of our discussion on miniatures and board games. Whereas last week featured us talking about the pros and cons of miniatures and meeples and what we like better, this week we're going to be sharing some of our favorite games with lots of miniatures with a specific look towards fantasy games. After that, we've got two completely unrelated reviews. First up being Tome the Light Edition and its expansion. This is another new trick-taking game. I guess it has a fantasy theme, so I guess it kind of ties in, but definitely no miniatures here. And then Astra, which is an area-majority-based game all about stargazing. Um, We wrap up with another busy week in review, and I think the big one people are going to want to hear about are my first thoughts on Marrakesh. But Sean also has a number of first plays to talk about. Well, we talk a lot about a lot of stuff on this show. Find links to all of it in our show notes at tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 223. That's 223. Where possible, those links will be affiliate links, which cost you nothing at all to use, but support us. Also, many games discussed tonight will be review copies, which were provided by publishers. Let's get going with a trip to the suggestion box. Welcome to this week's suggestion box. Here we share some pertinent interactions from the last little bit. Well, Robert Secretius, Secretius, sent us a note about our Revolution of 1828 review. Robert writes, I appreciate the review. I love history and found many copies of the game for $12.99 at a thrift store. Upon review, the history theme is lacking, but the gameplay is good. I guess like playing a game of hearts or spades with no theme. I guess for the money, it's worth it. So first off, that is a fantastic price. Like, like jump on that. Jump, like definitely pick up the game at that price. And tell your friends, uh, like, I'm kind of bummed you didn't tell us where you found it, because then we could have shared that with others. So I guess maybe you want to keep them for yourselves. Um, that This is a game that I'd be perfectly happy to pay full price. I did not pay full price. I got it off another local gamer in a trade. But anyway, I would pay full price. It's, it's really good. Next, though, I do want to bring up the historical part, because I, I feel Robert's like just throwing it out a little too easy. It's not like the game has no history to it or that it doesn't tie in its theme. The game is based on a historic American uh, voting period, an election, and it features the actual people who were in that vote and the actual election writings at the time and so on. There's a bunch of different like event tokens that represent actual things that happened and strategies that both sides used during that election. And most importantly, I think, and this is the one that really ties the theme to the game as much as anything does, is the press, because this was the first a big event in the U.S. where the press played a huge part in swaying public opinion. It was, it was the first time an election was as visible, public, and the knowledge was out there. And it was also the first time with the big slandering and and slag campaigns against the other people where it became a much more populist thing. That is all there. The history is still there. The thing is, none of that matters in regards to the gameplay. The gameplay is a tug of war, collecting tokens, trying to set up combos, area majority game. It's still a game based in history, though, enough so that I could even see using this to teach a history lesson even though the game's abstract. Though the theme could be anything else and the game would still work. And then we have Dylan Lusk, who commented on our Boop review to say, Boop is kid-friendly as well. My four-year-old loves to play with this, and we've been able to slowly introduce rules with him. See, that's good to know. I wanted to include this in the chat because we've talked about Boop and we talked about how accessible it is. And I know the rulebook has variants for playing with younger kids. Really simple. You don't use the cats. Um, But it's actually good to hear someone who has younger kids who has been enjoying it. My kids are well past me being able to judge if if a preschooler would enjoy a game with them anymore. So that's really cool to hear. So Boop, also good for preschoolers. Well, that's all for this week. Thank you to everyone who comments, shares, and interacts with our stuff. So far, so good as to keeping to the schedule. But this is another reminder that we will be taking some time off later in the month when the holiday sales 
really start to hit. Yeah, also a reminder to watch the blog for our holiday gaming deals landing page, which will be coming up soon enough, and to subscribe to our Tabletop Gaming Deals newsletter. I'll throw a link in the show notes for that. And make sure to follow our various Tabletop Gaming Deals accounts on social media. We'll make sure links to all of that are placed in the show description. Also, please don't take this as telling you to ignore your friendly local game store during this great holiday season and telling you only to shop online. Please do support local stores that disturb it, especially stores that provide you with more than just a place to buy games. Also, though, stay within your budget, and sometimes that's going to mean shopping online. In that case, be sure to support your local store in other ways. Pick up gaming accessories, get your sleeves there, host game nights for them, do demos, pick up minis, or shop the non-gaming stuff they have. Find some way to support a store that supports your community. Now, next up, I do want to give everyone a heads up on an email hiccup that actually affected Sean and I that we just noticed on Monday. So at some point in August uh, this year, GoDaddy changed its mail server name for our blog, and that's who we use for our hosting service. And we must have missed the notice. Now, I'm not blaming GoDaddy. I'm sure they sent something out and we just looked past it. It got sent to spam. Who knows? But what happened was neither Sean or I had been getting any emails to the at Tabletop Bellhop domain. You know, the one where we say email Mo at Tabletop Bellhop or send your questions to questions at Tabletop Bellhop. That one. We haven't gotten anything since August. Well, big apologies to anyone who wrote us using those during that period and was expecting a response. Yeah, so we were able to push forward all of the emails and we dumped them all into our inboxes the other day. And at this point, I have gotten through the backlog and I replied to anything that was still relevant. Unfortunately, there were a bunch of opportunities and things there that were time relevant that have passed. Um, but I can't promise that I didn't miss anything. So if you were expecting to hear from us or if you sent an email and you were expecting a reply and didn't get one, um, please do us a favor and resend that request, resend the email, and we'll be sure to get to it this time. Everything seems to be fixed now. I don't expect any other changes. Though I don't need your guest lists for conventions or customized packages of peanuts. Well, at least this explains why we haven't gotten any new questions lately. Well, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. Welcome to part two of our talk about miniatures and board games. Last week, we spent a good chunk of time uh, talking about the pros and cons of detailed miniatures and board games, as well as sharing our preferences in game components, what we like to use when we're playing games. And we ended up talking about that a little longer than expected. So I do think it was a great conversation. Um, I think it flowed really well, and I think it's worth checking out. The problem is we kind of ran out of time. The actual question we were answering came from Tito B.A., who wrote, Mo, I'm looking for a board game with lots of miniatures preferably fantasy themed i came across quest for the dragon lords but i got mixed reviews about it do you have any other suggestions so yeah the plan was to sit down and go okay what do you prefer minis or, or meeples or cubes and talk about it and then eventually give tito this nice big game list well not that big um but then we realized we were like an hour and a half in going back and forth on miniatures and board games and what we prefer and we were realizing the entire show we still had some uh, reviews to get to later in the show and lots to talk about in the bellhops table toss we're like you know what we're gonna call it so i think the first time ever we actually stopped the show midway and went, you know what, we're going to push this off till next week. So here we are with our first ever two-part Ask the Bellhop segment, again, talking about miniatures and board games, but this time specifically looking at games we dig that feature a ton of miniatures with an eye towards fantasy themes. So if you did miss last week, I do encourage you to pause here, go back to episode 222, Miniatures versus Meeples, and skip to the Ask the Bellhop segment and check out that talk. Now, I'm noting this because I have a feeling some of the feelings we shared there impacted the games we picked to talk about tonight. All caught up? Okay, well, let's get to the list. As usual, the only order here is the order in which the games came to mind when making this list. So the first game that popped into my head when I was thinking about fantasy games with lots of miniatures was Super Dungeon Explorer. Uh, this one was originally kickstarted by Soda Pop Miniatures, who ended up working with Ninja Division, and there was a big mess there with fulfillment and everything else but i'm not worried about that this was the first big miniature filled kickstarter i personally backed and a big thing we talked about last week was how for a while there it seemed like the kickstarters were coming every week with these massive things with multiple boxes and so many minis well 
Super Dungeon Explorer was was my first, the first one I backed like that. Now, this was a game that attempted to recreate the feel of fantasy button mashers, um, specifically games like Gauntlet, to some success on pulling it off. Now, the thing is, if you do pick this up, the core rulebook that came with it was so-so, and the core gameplay was so-so, but they did get in there and completely redevelop and rewrite the game and produced a new rulebook that's actually really good. Now, miniature-wise, these are great. They are great-looking miniature mini fantasy miniatures. You got heroes and orcs and goblins and all the stuff you'd expect, but they're all chibis, okay? So they're all, you know, the, the miniatures with the heads are as big as their bodies. And that alone, I know, is not going to be for everyone. Personally, I think it fits the aesthetic of the game going for that gauntlet 8 bit look, but I know not everyone likes chibi minis. Well, next up, we have Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game from Steamforged Games. And all of its expansions. Yeah. Now, the problem is that it's post-apocalyptic science fantasy. So probably not the sort of fantasy that Tito's looking for. You can't, however, deny that this game has some great minis and the mm. gameplay is rather solid as long as you are up for the epic length game <laughs> night yeah. or are cool with splitting your games up over multiple sessions. If you are, yeah, there's a lot of game there to love in Horizon Zero Dawn. Yeah, this is one we reviewed. So what I encourage you, if you're you're questioning this one, if you want to know more info, check out our review of Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game. And if it does look cool, they are about to launch a second Kickstarter for Horizon Forbidden West that looks very similar to the first one with even cooler miniatures. Next up, I've got War of the Ring, second edition from Ares Games. Not only does this Middle Earth board game have a ton of miniatures with more available through expansions, this is considered the best two-player board game in the world right now and the best war game in the world right now. Now, my concern with this recommendation, though, is I'm not sure why Tito's looking for fantasy miniatures. If it just games with a fantasy theme, great, pick this up. You're going to love it. But if you're actually picking up fantasy miniatures to maybe use with other games or possibly as D&D miniatures, you're not going to want to pick this up for that because these are small miniatures. These are like war game miniatures, right? They're not the same scale as D&D minis or Games Workshop. Also, even if you do just plan to use them in this game, be warned, some of the sculpts are very similar, especially with the different mounted troops. And many people at least partially paint their miniatures when playing this game. So they'll like paint the bases different colors so they stand out a little bit better so you can tell your mounted elf cavalry from your Riders of Rohan, for example. And I'm pulling those names out of my butt, my Lord of the Rings, out of my Mountain Doom. Um, so that might not be actually the troops that get confused. I just know there's some that are very similar. All right. Well, you knew we were going to get to Simon games eventually. So we're <laughs> going to start with Zombicide and in particular, Black Plague or Green Horde, as those are the fantasy versions where you're fighting necromancers, undead and infected orcs. Tons of great fantasy characters and monsters here as well as a solid cooperative game. We know people who go all in on any Zombicide Kickstarter just to get all of the miniatures without any interest in playing the game. Yeah. They make great minis for any fantasy game. Now, sticking with big Simon Kickstarters with tons of minis, I'm going to call out specifically Rising Sun. Though, honestly, this, our number five pick, could have been Blood Rage or Ankh, depending on which type of fantasy you're looking for between Asian, Norse, or Egyptian. These are all area majority games by Eric Lang that feature some of the coolest miniatures out there. These may in include your various factions, your troops. One of the big things is these games all include these monster minis that the players can bring into play during the game that are just fantastic, chunky, well, just awesome looking miniatures. I love their games. Now, of all the games I played, Rising Sun is my personal favorite. I especially love the, the tea party aspect of teaming up with different players. And I like the fact that there's some of the things where, like, the bards can tell stories of the battle and you can win just by being present while two other armies fight. It is my personal favorite, but that's also, I did go all in on the Kickstarter, so there might be a little bit bias there as well. But really, any of the Eric Lang, Simon area majority games. Well, sticking to another Simon game, I'm going to toss Cthulhu Death May Die out there. Now, I admit, calling this fantasy is a stretch. As it's said in the 1920s, but there are plenty of generic-looking culto cultists and a ton of mythos creatures that would fit in great for any period. Plus, you get a very different take on a Cthulhu game 
more of a two-fisted pulp guns blazing game than an investigative one. If you did the Kickstarter, you also got one of the biggest miniatures ever made, which also <laughs> doubles as a final quest board and maybe a, you know, a feeding bowl for, you know, a menagerie <laughs> of pets. All right, we could probably sit here all night and could have done the, our top 15 Simon games. So just check out anything else Simon has to offer for miniature heavy games. They are called Cool Mini or not for a reason. But let's move away from them and move over to one of the other big miniature game producers out there, and that is Fantasy Flight Games. And I'm going to start with the Descent series of games. Now, these are a series of dungeon crawling games that always came with pretty decent miniatures. Now, miniature gamers, I got to say, were like, yeah, I don't know about if I like these much because they were board game miniatures. They, they were kind of overly flexible and not too detailed. Detailed enough for a miniature gamer, but like the hobby gamers are like, come on, these look terrible. Personally, I thought they were fantastic for board game quality. And since the original Descent, uh, moving on to second edition and now Legends of the, of the Dark, I can't remember if it's of the dark or in the dark, my bad. Um, they've gotten better. The miniatures keep improving. Um, the sculpts keep getting better. The quality is better. The other thing that's nice is along with the miniatures getting better, the gameplay has changed from this one versus many, very adversarial, you feel evil playing the DM kind of thing, because it feels like you should be playing a role playing and helping the players, but you're playing against them to a now very cooperative game that is now fully app driven, which lets all the players work together and collaborate against the app, which also does things like added variety and things like that. I've enjoyed seeing the evolution of the Descent series over time. Well, another great fantasy flight game with quite a few minis is The Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle-Earth. Similar to Descent, this is an app-driven cooperative game set in Middle-Earth with a fully replayable campaign and multiple expansions out already, including a big one that just came out this year. We have friends who have completed this one and started over and are currently yeah. going through the campaign a second time and finding it very different from the first. Yeah, it's not often we recommend games we haven't personally played, but I do own this. I've read the instructions. We've gotten, um, I think we have the unboxings live. We have an unboxing. I don't remember if we released it or not of this one. This game looks fantastic. I just haven't had the time to play a campaign game. Of all the games on the list, this is the one I personally want to play through the most. But like it has come so strongly recommended from friends of ours that I figured I, I, don't, I feel comfortable recommending it myself. All right, speaking of Lord of the Rings, if you are looking for a ton of smaller miniatures, um, even smaller than the ones in Lord of the Ring, great for, say, smaller dungeon tiles. Like, I, I'm surprised I don't see more people who run RPGs doing this and shrinking things down and using these smaller miniatures with smaller maps just for table space um, or using representing armies on a map. I actually recommend Risk Lord of the Rings Trilogy Edition. Now, remember, this isn't just a list of games with a lot of miniatures. These are games we actually recommend because they're good games. I found this to be the best standard version of Risk out there. Now, I say standard because I'm excluding Risk Legacy. Risk Legacy is fantastic. Pick it up. You're not going to find any fantasy miniatures there. You're going to find post-apocalyptic ones. If you're looking for tiny little Mad Max dudes, pick that up maybe. But Risk Lord of the Rings Trilogy Edition is really solid because you can just play it as Risk if you love Risk but it's on the Middle Earth map, but you can also play it in the like saga version where there's a whole aspect where there's the fellowship trying to make their way to Mount Doom, which becomes a timer in the game, which is the thing that most people complain the most about risk going on forever. Well, if the hobbits get to Mount Doom, the game's over, or if they get wiped out before they get there. Well, next we have another company that falls under the Asmodee brand with Mice and Mystics from Plaid Hat Games. Now, this storybook game has fantastic fantasy minis, with a twist. The characters here are mice, and their adversaries are things like rats, centipedes, and spiders. For some cute, cool and unique minis, check out the Tail Feathers standalone expansion for mice riding flying birds. In addition to unique minis, you get a fantastic story that's great to play through as a family. I, 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 I am so bummed that Tail Feathers did not take off more. It, it used a flight path system. You actually had birds that pivoted so you could like it mattered which way you were turning. Such a great game that, that I, I keep hoping. Plaid Hat's still around. There's still a chance there'll be more coming. All right. I'm going to wrap up our main set of suggestions with the classic. Um, I don't know if you can still see it above your head. No, the camera's still up too far down. And that is Hero Quest. Uh, the original Milton Bradley Games Workshop collaboration, which was recently re-released 
and reprinted through Hasbro Pulse. The new version has even more miniatures with different sculpts than the original. While I still love the original Warhammer-based miniatures, and they'll, they'll always be some of my favorites, I can't deny how much nicer the new ones really look. And I gotta say, it's great to have it so that every orc doesn't look the same anymore. Now, a bonus here that I think is great if you are thinking of getting this game for the miniatures to use possibly in D&D or another RPG is that you also get some truly great looking scenery. You're not just getting heroes and things to fight against them. If anyone has seen any of our Gloomhaven live streams or anything like that, is, is, is any of those, I use the scenery from HeroQuest in everything. If I am playing a fantasy game, you're probably going to see a cardboard bookshelf from the original game somewhere on the table. It's also nice to see that Hasbro is finally putting out brand new content for the game. So not only did they publish the original stuff through Pulse, they then brought back the Barbarian Quest Pack and the Elf Quest Pack, though they renamed them, and they have now brand new adventures, so the game continues to grow. Well, next we have a few honorable mentions. Games we haven't personally played, but that look pretty good, at least as far as the minis are concerned. All right, the first one I have is Dark Souls, the board game. Now, I don't know too much about this one myself, um, but when I was doing the Google, I always I always research these up topics like some a lot of it comes off my head. But then I, go, I look online and I Google it and like board games with lots of minis. And I'm like, Is there anything I missed? Well, this came up on a number of other people's recommendations. So I wanted to include it. Now, what I have read about this turns me off. It is a brutally hard cooperative miniature game, which I guess that represents Dark Souls. Like there's a whole Souls like style of game, which is these games where you have to figure out that you, you go in and you die and then you're like you start to figure out the pattern or you figure out the trick, right? Well, I guess they did a good job of getting that into the board game. And I, from what I've heard from Dark Souls fans, the aesthetic of this perfectly captures the aesthetic of the digital version. Now, when this came out in 2017, it did nab a couple of awards and new content is still coming out for it. Well, I've got up Cthulhu Wars which has the largest, chunkiest miniatures of any of the games mentioned tonight, if you exclude the giant from Death May Die. Now, this yeah. is an asymmetric game where you get to play the Elder Gods flying, vying for control of the Earth, uh, which is a swap from what you usually see in Mythos-themed games. Next, I'm going to call out Kingdom Death Monster. Uh, again, this was a Kickstarter with a bit of a sordid pass and some fulfillment issues. But this featured the most ambitious series of miniatures I've seen in a board game. That is, if you're into Beefcake Frazetta style artwork and optional pinup versions of your fantasy miniatures. If that's your thing, you're going to want to try to find a copy of Kingdom Death Monster. The people I know who got this are really digging it, though it's honestly the miniature painters in my, my friend group who really jumped at this one. Well, next we have Sword and Sorcery, which is an extremely well-regarded dungeon crawler that, similar to Gloomhaven, uses an AI system to eliminate the Game Master player and is thus fully cooperative. The miniatures here give me a big Hero Quest feel and are of that yeah. same solid board game quality as the Descent series. And this one appeals because it doesn't need an app, as we've talked about many times. Apps kind of scare me for possibly no longer working. I own board games that I can no longer play because they had an integration and it's now gone. All right, so I'm going to have two more here. Um, these are games that at least I played, but are long out of print. They're going to be hard to find. You can't just go on online and buy them now, and if you can, you're going to probably find them for a ridiculous price you don't want to pay. But these are also games that I keep stumbling upon. Games that you find at local game stores that still have new old stock or on eBay, or you go to a yard sale or a thrift store and find them. These are games that if you're looking for fantasy miniatures, keep your eyes open for them. Well, the first is Mage Knight, the miniature game, not the board game. It's one of the best solo games out there. The old clicks-based war game features pre-painted miniatures, war machines, and scenery. WizKids put out a mix of subpar to truly fantastic miniatures for this series when it lasted. Mm -hmm. And there's a variety of pieces that Mo uses in other fantasy games. Uh, also, the base game just wasn't that bad at all. Yeah. Sort of Warhammer skirmish with less complex complexity and none of the hobby. Now, the next one you can get, but you should be able to start getting again soon. And that is Hero Scape, not to be confused with Hero Quest, Hero Scape. 
This is a hex-based battle game featuring miniatures from all over time and space, including some great-looking fantasy ones. Now, the big feature of this game was the pre-painted miniatures a bit, but more importantly, the plastic hex tiles you use to make a three-dimensional board. They came in all shapes and sizes, and eventually they added things like trees, walls, bridges, and castles. Now, the main, excuse me. Now, the main reason I wanted to have this on our list is that after Hasbro failed to bring the back the game back through Hasbro Pulse, um, I guess lightning doesn't strike twice. I fully expected that the fund as well as HeroQuest did. Um, they they dropped it, but then Renegade Games has since picked up the license and is bringing HeroScape back. Well, there you have it. Our thoughts on miniatures in board games, and then some of our favorite board games that feature a ton of miniatures with an eye towards fantasy miniatures in particular. So do you have a game suggestion for Tito? What, what's a board game you own or know of that has a ton of fantasy miniatures in it? Let us know in the comments. Email me, mo at tabletopbellhop.com. I promise it's working now. Or hit me up on social media where I can be found pretty much everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Even better, join our Discord at discord.com slash tabletopbellhop. That'd be a great place to let us know your thoughts on meeples versus miniatures. As I'm sure you've noticed, we love trick-taking games around here, and it's time to review another modern trick-taker, Home, the Light Edition, and its expansion. A trick taker that will appeal to trading card game fans. Tome the Light Edition was originally kickstarted back in 2021 by Reversal Games and is now available to buy direct from their web store at a nice low MSRP of only 15 bucks for the base game and 5 bucks for the expansion. This trick taking card game was designed by Anthony Thorpe, who we have to thank for telling us about his game and handing us a review copy to bring home from Origins 2023. We also got to watch a demo by the game's artist, Lauren Yu. So Tome is listed as a two to four player game. And while the game instructions include rules for three players, it's really meant to be played with four and works pretty well with two. Sadly, we can't recommend this one at three. At the full player count of four, the game is rather quick, taking under an hour to play and isn't not that much quicker with two. One thing to watch here is the weight. A lot is going on in games of Tome, putting the complexity way above traditional trick taking games. Yeah. This is one for the card gamers more so than a gateway from traditional playing card games you'd find in Hoyle. Now, Tome is a spell casting card game where each card represents a different spell, each having a different in-game effect. Each hand, a card is flipped up from what's called the element deck. This is the title spell, which sets the trump suit for the round. A card is led and its effect happens. Further card plays that match the suit of the lead card also have their effects happen. But if someone plays off suit, the spell chain is broken. The spell is silenced and has no effect. Any cards that are played after that, though, do have their full effect, no matter of their suit. In addition, every game has a special suit included, which isn't affected by the chain system. Tome, the light edition, comes with four standard suits. Fire, earth, wind, and water, and the special suit, light, thus the game's name. The Gold Codex expansion contains two more standard suits, Wood, an Insect, and the special suit, Gold. Now, future versions of the game will include more standard suits and more special suits, and it looks like Tome the Sound Edition is what's coming next. Tome was one of the games we picked up during Origins with plans to play it at the con after we were done yep. each day, so we don't have an unboxing video to share with you. There isn't a ton to show off either way, though, as most of what you have here are cards. Yeah, uh, Tome the Light Edition has 24 basic cards, six each in four different suits, six special cards of one suit, four reference cards, and a set of eight scorecards, two for each player. There's also four health counters in the rulebook. Now, the Gold Codex comes with 18 more cards and a single reference card explaining how to use them. The box is nice. I got to call it out. It's a nice, like, bookshelf, like, looks like a book on your shelf, shuts magnetically. And there's plenty of room for the base game and the gold codex with enough room for at least one or, if not two, similarly sized expansions. The rulebook here is okay, but not great. It works best when combined with the reference cards, though even with both of those, we found ourselves checking Board Game Geek for a few clarifications on parts of the game. The card quality, though, is great, and the cards have a nice linen finish. While they aren't reversible, that makes sense in this case, as each card has a significant amount of text on it. 
Yeah, and this text is my only complaint quality wise uh, in regards to Tome. It's it's rather small because this game does something we've mentioned many times where they spent all the card space on the artwork. And I got to say, it's it's nothing against the artist, but it's very abstract artwork here. It's not like you're showing off fantasy creatures or anything. So you have this large spot for the abstract artwork and a small spot for the text, which leads to a pretty small font. Tome is a two to four player modern trick taking game with the main mode of playing being a four player team game with teammates sitting opposite each other at the table. Now, before starting a game with Tome, you must first make the deck. This is done by picking four standard certs to use and one special suit. Now, if you only own Tome the Light Edition, base game box, or another base set, you're gonna be good to go. If you have any of the expansions though, or more than one of them, you're going to have to do some mixing and matching to get the game set up. Each team is given a pair of scorecards and dealt a hand of six cards. The remaining six cards are placed face down on the table and the top card is revealed. This face up card is called the title card. The player to the left of the dealer leads any card from their hand. This card starts what's considered a spell chain. The effect of that card goes off when played. The card effects in Tome are a huge part of the game and are extremely varied. They are different for each card in each suit, Through this, though the suits tend to have themes. For example, fire cards tend to be better based on how many other fire cards are already in play. Water cards are mutable and let you swap elements and draw additional cards and things. Now, after the first card's led, the next player plays. If they follow suit, their card's effect happens and play continues to the next player. As long as everyone follows suits, all the cards are played and their effects go off. Now, when someone does play off suit with a standard suit card, the spell chain is broken and that card has no effect. From then on, no matter what anyone plays, though, all cards have their effects go off. Now, tricks are won by the highest card played. A card matching the suit of the title card, remember that's one we flipped up earlier, is considered trump. And the highest played trump card takes the trick. If there are no trump cards played, then the highest played card takes the trick with ties going to the first card played. Each trick is worth one point, except for the last hand of a round, the sixth trick, which is worth two. The winner of the trick, though, does get the next lead in all cases. One thing to note here is that hands in this game are very mutable. The value yeah. of cards can and will be changed by other cards, as can the suits of the cards. While water may be the color of the title spell at the start of the hand, that title spell could change suits or even be removed from play or swapped for another card before the hand is done. And then there's the special suit. These cards don't affect the chain at all when played, and they're a different color, so they stick out, and their abilities always happen. If someone leads a special card, the first basic card played after that does start a chain. Now, if a special card is revealed as the title card, that hand is played with no trump. The game continues with the dealer passing to the left at the end of each round and everyone getting a new hand of six with the leftover cards forming a new element deck. The game ends when one team has at least 15 points and at least two more points than their opponents. So that's the basic four player way to play Tome. There are also some variants including the rule book, including survival mode, which works with three or four players. Here there's no teams, it's everyone for themselves and each and each trick, the player who played the lowest card loses one health, and there's these little counters to track this. Each player only has two health total, and when they're eliminated, every other player still in the game gets one point. The first player to 10 points wins in survival mode. Then there's dual mode for two players. Each player starts with six cards. The element deck is also six cards, but then there's a 12 card draw deck. Play goes back and forth uh, between both players using all the normal rules with each player playing two cards per trick and the highest card taking the trick as usual. At the start of each round and after each trick, players draw a card from the draw deck before flipping over the title card. Scoring and victory conditions stay the same. So as I think it's pretty obvious from that overview of play, there is a lot going on in a game of tone. Five out of six standard cards in each suit have a completely different, unique ability from every other card in the set. Then every suit has what's called a flux card. That's the F card, um, which is the highest card and it can't be modified up or down in any way. Then you have the special cards. Now, to make things somewhat easier, the special cards do all share the same ability, but then they have their own unique special rules like they don't break the spell chain. All of that is just a lot to take in. We play a lot of trick takers, as many listeners you're certainly aware of. 
but I found this one to be even tougher to learn than the one we reviewed last week, Aurum, despite it breaking some real standards yeah. of trick-taking games. Yeah, this one's actually closer to traditional trick-taking, but there's just so much going on. Like, right from the start, I want to say, before I go any further, this is not a game to break out with your Euchre buddies or something new for your group to play on Poker Night. This game has a lot more in common with trading card games and dedicated deck board games than it does with playing cards. It's all about knowing the cards, how they combo together, and outplaying your opponents. Learning the card abilities doesn't take too long, though once you start mixing in expansions, you're certainly mm -hmm. upping the difficulty of remembering which ones you have in play and what those do as opposed to which ones were left out. Now, card counting is also encouraged in this game, though I find it's actually easier here than traditional games because there's only six cards in each suit. Each round, every card will come into play one way, either in a player's hand or as a title card flipped up from the element deck. This is especially important the last trick of the hand, because at that point, everyone will see every card except for the three in everyone else's hand. This is the reason that final hand is worth double points. And I should note that remembering that that hand is worth two points is part of the learning curve. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to forget that detail with everything else going on. Now, once you get past that pretty steep learning curve, there's a really solid game here. It's very cutthroat, and a lot of the fun is looking at what you have, trying to figure out what the other players are holding that, and using it to steal a trick. Very few hands in Tome are going to be quickly throw down the cards and the highest card wins. It's all about manipulating things so that you or your partner take that point. There's a lot of puzzle elements to this game that I think some gamers are really going to enjoy. The interaction both within and between the suits is quite interesting and has clearly been thought out. Hoping yep. the chain gets broken before it comes to you or eager that it doesn't break are both regular occurrences you have to mm -hmm. deal with. And playing with partners really is a highlight in this game, leading to some great interactions and smart card play. Breaking the chain so your partner can play a card or changing the title card because you know your partner picked up the flux of that color last round. Tossing out a flux off suit, just hoping your partner can do something. With it. All of these lead to fun interactions, no matter whether you end up taking that trick or not. Play order here really matters. Sometimes you might even wish you hadn't won that last trick because going first means you have to pick the right card because you can't break the chain for your partner, leaving them to either follow it, follow it or break it themselves if they don't have the right hand to back you up. Now, all of that. All of that fun applies to playing Tome with four players, and to some extent with two. Tome is great with four players, and it's quite good with two. When you're playing with two, it's very cutthroat, and it makes it work because you're playing two cards. You're not just playing one, right? Like You're, you're basically playing a two-handed trick, right? You're, you're playing back and forth, kind of like playing Euchre double-handed. It's way more enjoyable than I expected at two, though I'd rather still play with four. So unfortunately, as seems to be a theme of late, there are other player counts available for this game that are listed on the box and in the rulebook. Yeah, where we can't recommend Tome, and I know Sean completely agrees with me, is three players. Or honestly, just using the survival mode at any player count. In survival mode, the game isn't about winning tricks, it's about not losing. It's all about not playing the lowest numbered card, and honestly, it just doesn't seem to work along with trick taking. Like when you've got mechanics out there like Trump and swappable Trump, like being the lowest, it's just, it, it's just too random. It's, it's, if you get lower cards, you're pretty much stuck. It just very much feels like you have no control over your fate in survival mode. Plus it has one of the worst game mechanics that I think most modern gamers can agree. It has player elimination. You're, you, you're gonna sit there and get eliminated and watch other people play for some period of time. With three players, that's pretty quick. But once you get up to four, it can take a while for the other players to go out. Honestly, when we first tried this game at Origins, we played with only three players, and I felt we might have made a mistake agreeing to even review this game at that point. Yeah. Now, while the difference between three and four player formats and some trick takers is meh versus marvelous, this one, while not unplayable, meh is too high of an <laughs> accolade for this three player version. I, I, I can't disagree. Now, as for the Gold Codex, I didn't think the Gold Codex um, changed the game enough to warrant its own review. So I'm throwing it in here with the other. It's a good expansion. Um, when you just have Tome the Light Edition, you have the same suits every game, which is fine. You're going to learn those cards, right? That's going to really help that learning curve. 
um, which is really cool. And there's no setup, right? Like your deck's ready to go. You just shuffle and start playing at the beginning. But you, I, I did find there was a lack of variety. Tossing in the gold codex has a huge amount of replayability of the game. Just the number of possible combinations, because you have two more standard suits and you always use four. So now you're picking four out of six. And then you have a completely different special suit you can throw in. So you got four out of six, which you can play with two different suits. And I'm not into permutations and combinations, but that is a lot of new ways to play the game. So a problem I found, however, is after having that steep learning curve and getting past it, you now run into it all over again when you add yeah. in new suits. And you don't know all of the effects and interactions that you've now added into this game that you just finally, finally figured out. And I think there's a similarity here to sitting down and playing a game of Magic the Gathering with a brand new set and you haven't seen the cards yet. And you're kind of, what's that do? Can you pass me that? And sure, in a month's time, you're going to be, you're going to recognize the cards by their colors and you're going to know all the possible combinations. But there's that learning curve as soon as you throw in a new suit. Now, there are also a couple of other drawbacks to the gold codex that we found. Now, the first is in regards to the graphic design. The card color and the design of the gold insect and wood cards are all similar. Like, like I've never seen a, a so brown, yellow, fall looking package of board game stuff at once. Now, I will say the gold's not bad because, well, it has a different, it's a white border. So that's pretty easy to find out. But the wooden insects still to this day look similar in my hand. And what I try to do now is I try not to include both in the same game. I'll just I'll use one or the other so I don't even have that possibility of mixing them up. And this graphic issue is worse if you're not playing in really good light. Yeah. While card games like this are usually great to play anywhere in general, this game struggles in poor lighting. So visibility is something to think about when considering if you want to bring this game along anywhere. Now, the other issue I found with the Gold Codex is that the card abilities felt more complicated. There were just more things going on. They, it, they relied more on what had already been played or what's going to be played future, and they better rewarded card counting. They seemed to be suited to experienced players. And well, I guess that makes sense, right? This is an expansion. They don't expect you to pick up and play the expansion until you played the base game, right? But the first time I introduced this game at a public event, I made a mistake. I had already mixed the expansion in with my core game, and I just let it, left it in there. And I went with the first four suits I found for what we played. And I found it, including these, made it even more of a learning curve and enough so that at least for one player, it was just too much. There was just too many variables to take count on. Tome has enough going on as it is. I strongly suggest anyone doing a learning game Stick to your basic elements of earth, fair, earth, air, fire, and water. Fair, I, I, I merged to earth, air, fire, and water, at least for the first couple hands in, well, full games, I would say, first couple full games before trying to toss in that expansion. Yeah, even having played the base game several times, it was a struggle all over again to figure out the new cards and the style of play that each suit encouraged. Now, while things got off to a rough start with Tome, I got to say, in the end, we found a very solid modern trick taker in there. To me, this game, this is a trick taking card game for tradition, uh, for trading and living card game players. And honestly, when I'm introducing it, someone to new, you know how people are like, well, it's like Monopoly, but well, what I like to say is this is Euchre for Magic players due to how each card has its own ability and the whole spell casting theme. It's really hard to do, argue with that description. It's a thinking trick taker and as such, less of a social game as you need that bit of additional focus when playing to track the spells and their effects. Now, I'm sure if everyone at the table has played many times, you'll be able to relax with more familiarity, but throw in an expansion and it will go silent once again as everyone focuses on the new spells available. Well, I won't recommend this game at three players. Otherwise, if you dig card games with a puzzle elements, games where it's all about playing your cards in the right order, reading your opponents to figure out what they've done, you really should enjoy Tome. That's going to be even more true if you already enjoy trick-taking games, especially partner-based games like Euchre. If counting cards is your thing and you want to up the difficulty, uh, also remembering which spell is on which card, this certainly <laughs> offers that extra challenge. Now, I also won't recommend Tome as a my first modern trick taker uh, for someone who's only really knows traditional Hoyle style uh, card games. There is a pretty steep learning curve here, even for experienced card game players. And I feel this would just be completely overwhelming as a totally new player. 
Now, if you're looking for something like that, that's a step above, you know, spades, hearts and euchre, maybe take a look at games like, say, the Fox in the Forest or the crew. Well, that's it for our look at Tome, specifically the Light Tome, the Light Edition and the first Tome expansion, the Gold Codex, one of the most involved modern trick takers we've played that we think will really appeal to card game players. Now, we've talked about a lot of trick takers on the show, and our blog is filled with trick taking card game reviews. So what I want to know is what's your favorite modern trick taker, non-hoil? What's what's a non-traditional? I want to hear all about it, especially if it's something we haven't actually covered yet. If you enjoyed this review and any of our other content, trick taking related or not, please <laughs> consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. It's time for some stargazing as we share our thoughts on Astra from Mind Clash Games, who we have to thank for sending us home a review copy from Origins. So Astra comes from a set of three designers whose names I'm probably about to butcher. I apologize. First is Patrick Porklaw. Next, Frenius Chauveril. Then Esther Christina Sapp. Features some very pretty artwork from Chilla Farkita. And it was technically published last year, though we didn't discover this one until Origins Game Fair in 2023. Astra is an area majority point solid for two to five players that plays in 45 minutes to an hour, mainly based on the player count. The age here is listed as 10 plus, though we could see some young players also enjoying it. Now, in Astra, players are astronomer, astronomer, astronomers. I, the M and N switch there. Let's try that a second. I'm sorry. That's it's from trying to pronounce those names. Now I'm going to start pronouncing the English stuff wrong just to keep it up and show that just that I can't talk. And it's not actually the difficulty of your names. In Astra, players are astronomers determined to explore and understand the various constellations. Actual gameplay here has players send, spending stardust to mark off stars on constellation cards. The player to mark the final star collects the card and can then use its abilities, but every other player who helped along the way gets a bonus. This game features an interesting mix of give and take and simple rules that hides surprising depth. Get a look at the great artwork, oversized cards, and other components in our Astra unboxing video on YouTube. There you can see the game's smallish and solid box, some very nice oversized cards, dry erase markers, stardust crystals, telescope markers, two-sided player boards, the rule book, and a few other components. Component quality here really is great. Uh, this game features the best dry erase anything I have ever written on and erased. Now, one minor issue I do want to call out for anyone who, who picks this up is when you first get the cards, due to the plastic coating, they tend to stick together. Um, just be aware when sorting out the cards the first game, when I had to pull out a, a, a you know, pull out 25 cards, I think I pulled out 36 the first time. So you might want to try to pull those one at a time instead of sliding through them. Now, the other thing I do want to call out is more on the positive side, and that is this game has a fantastic rule book that is extremely clear and very complete, including a reference paragraph for every single card in the game. Now, setting up Astra is pretty quick. You take the deck of Constellation cards, shuffle it, and then pull off a stack of cards, the number of which is based on the player count. You then put the game end card on top of these, slightly askew, and put the rest of the cards on top of that. You then flip up and discard one card, starting the discard pile. Uh, you place the appropriate main board in the center of the table, this little round board that's basically just to situate everything, and draw and place cards around it from the deck. Now, the board choice and the number of cards is based on the player count. It's technically player count plus one. Then you place the sphere marker, which is this little kind of plastic thing, on the element shown on the card you flipped up. And there's four elements in the game. Each player collects a player board, eight stardust, stardust tokens, and a marker in the color of their choice. They should also each collect a rule summary and scoring card. These are asymmetric, so players shouldn't show them to the other players. The player who last saw a shooting star starts. On a player's turn, you have two options. You either observe or pass. In addition to this, before taking either actions, you do have the option to activate any constellation cards you previously collected that aren't tapped. When a player chooses to observe, they mark off a number of stars on a single constellation card in play, equal to the amount of stardust they're willing to spend. 
There are very specific rules for what you can fill out, including having to start on a specific spot and not being able to branch your path or double back. When doing this, marking off of constellations and stars, if you fill in a grand star, this is kind of represented by like a, a star burst, you get to mark off one wisdom on your player board. The amount of wisdom you have determines how many cards you can have in your tableau at any point, and it's going to be worth points at the end of the game for how much wisdom you've gained. After any player has done their turn, you check to see if any of the cards now have every star on them filled. In this case, the player who filled in the last star gets to take the card first. But any other players who marked any stars on the card get a bonus. Each card lists four bonuses, and players get a choice of these based on the area majority rules. The player who helped the most gets the first pick, the second most the next, and so on. Note the player taking the card gets to keep the card, so doesn't get any of the bonuses. Once this is resolved, new cards are added to any vacancies that have been created. Now, these card bonuses include all kinds of things like grabbing a bunch of stardust. You can just take points. You might be able to increase the size of your star stardust bag, which gives you more stardust when you rest and is worth points at the end of the game. You might be able to untap some of your tap cards or collect telescope tokens. Telescope tokens can be spent on a player's turn after taking an observe action to take another action. This is the only way you could ever complete a constellation card on your own and is a way you can branch paths or fill in different sections of the same card. Now the other option instead of observing is to pass. In this case, you collect stardust equal to your stardust pouch size, so up to, so you refill. Then you ready any constellation cards that match the element in the sphere marker is in at that time, then move the sphere marker clockwise. Now, this may cause you to discard the top card off the top of the deck, which is a timing mechanism in the game. Note, it might be worth passing, even if you already have Stardust, either to fill it up to the to top it off or just to ready some of your cards. Speaking of those cards, every constellation card you collect has an ability on it and is worth points at the end of the game as long as they are ready. You use these cards at the start of your turn and can use as many as you want to. They do all kinds of things like letting you draw for free, collecting more stardust, drawing on more than one constellation a turn, earning points for filling in grand stars, and more. When you use a card, it becomes unready, aka you tap it. Be aware that you can only hold as many cards as your wisdom level on your player board indicates. If you gain more cards than you can hold, you have to discard down to your wisdom limit. Odd play continues until you hit that end of game card that you put a skew in the deck, and then you read the instructions on it, which tells you whether everyone gets another turn or if the first player gets to go or whatever. Players then total up their points. Players will have earned some points during the game. To that, they will add their point value of all their ready card, value of their current Stardust bag size, their current wisdom value, and then points for collecting sets of cards. Now, the scorecard every one player got at the beginning of the game those all four elements and two of these will be already crossed off and they're different for every player to this players are going to add in the cards they collected and mark those off and then calculate your score for your sets. I'm not going to get into the full details here, but collecting three or more different elements is worth points as is collecting two or more cards of the same element with the best possible score being awarded for having four cards of the same element. And whoever has the most points wins. Now, to me, the most shocking thing about Astra is that this game comes from Mind Clash Games. These are the people behind my favorite board game of all time, Anachrony. And oddly, the only thing these two games have in common, except the publisher, is that the names both start with A. Well, Anachrony is a big, meaty game, an epic game experience, both in production quality and gameplay. Astra is a simple-to-learn, fast-playing game that players can learn to play in minutes. That said, though, it's no party game. Games often go longer than half an hour, and the decisions here aren't easy. I'm just shocked by how different a game Mind Clash this is, Astra is, from Mind Clash's other games. The really interesting thing about Astra is the mechanics. The actual thought behind patterns and choices with what options you have and what powers the card give you uh, are very well thought out. And yeah. perhaps that, more than anything, suggests the more meaty origins of the publishers. Yeah, this game just feels very well play tested and developed. It just it feels like everything's there for a reason. and Everything's very well balanced. And I really enjoyed the simplicity and purity of Astra. 
there's only two options each turn, at least until you've collected a few cards that can give you a couple more options. You basically either draw or pass. The thing is, trying to figure out what to draw, where to draw it, and how much to draw it is quite tactical and also strategic. Added to this is the decision to collect cards, when to collect them, and which ones to collect, which sets are you going through. You're going to quickly notice when playing this game that the bonus rewards for players who help can actually be more valuable than the cards itself. But then you can't ignore collecting cards either because that end game set scoring can cause a huge swing in points at the end of the game. So I'm going to say up front, this game actually isn't for me. Uh, in particular, the theme and how they presented it hit a sour note with me. Now, that being said, I can't deny that the skill and quality of this game is there. The level of thought required of it and that was put into it are impressive. Now, for me, where this game shines is as a public play game. This is a fantastic game to bring out to events for me. This is a game I can set up and have everyone playing in minutes. This is also a game that works just as well at all player counts. It's just as good with two as it is with five. It's a game I can teach the basics of in minutes, and it has a theme that's familiar to most people, making it very approachable. Though I gotta say, there are people out there that aren't going to be a fan of the theme, like Sean. Indeed. But more than that, it's how they present it. In particular, astronomers don't explore constellations, nor do they strive to understand them. Now, if admittedly minor details like that don't bother you, and for the majority I expect they won't, this game does have a lot to offer in an easy-to-learn package. Yeah, though actually the theme here is you are some Greek astrologer, so they are striving to understand. I can't remember its name. All the constellations come from an actual historic book. Um, but the thing is, that's not well presented as the theme, which is probably why Sean didn't even know till now. Well, they, they do state in their description, astronomer, which is yeah. kind of the... Of the people we played it with, my wife and oldest daughter are the ones who love Astra. Um, it was Deanna that convinced me to take home or, well, to ask for a review copy at Origins after we played a short game demo. And if I remember at the time, I kind of said, uh, this one, it, are you sure? Okay, sure, I'll ask. <laughs> she still loves it and often requests I bring it with us when heading out to a public play event she'll be at. For me, I didn't love it as much as her, but I have been enjoying my plays of the game. I have to admit it did get better the more I played. As you start to learn the various different card effects and you can try out different strategies. I definitely enjoyed my last play of Astra more than my first and more than I did at that demo. Now we talk about themes and their importance on this show with some regularity. In this case, for me, it's overpowered the mechanics. But that's not to say it's a bad game. As with all of our reviews, every game is for someone. Who that is depends on many factors. Now what I've really found interesting though is just how different this game plays depending on who you play it with and the strategies they try. This to me is actually the most fascinating part about Astra isn't the game, it's how people play it. Some players are all about spending every bit of stardust they have every turn and making sure they have drawn their color is everywhere. They wanna have as much of their color out on the cards. Other players though, just wanna have that one dot. They want one star on every single constellation. Then other players just want to make sure they're, they're getting bonuses. Other players are all about collecting the cards and using their powers and pulling off these combos where they never have to spend Stardust and get to fill in eight things every turn and take three cards home a turn. I played with players who try to never rest. That's their goal in the game. They sit down they're like resting seems like a wasted turn. All I'm going to do is take things that give me bonus Stardust so I never have to rest. And then I played with other players who rest all the time. Then they'll have a full bag, full pouch, full of Stardust, yet they're still resting because they're hoping to untap their cards. Uh, the best part of all of this is I haven't seen any one of these ways to play come out as any better than any of the others. The sheer volume of cards certainly plays a large part in this range of strategies, and I wouldn't be surprised if the opening set of cards, in combination with your scoring card, which again is unique, wasn't a major factor in how yeah. people played. Uh, even beyond the, their first game, where it's to be expected, that's going to set your tone. Now, overall, Astra ended up being better than I thought it would be. Sure, it was a huge surprise to me when compared to Mind Clash's other games, but it's not strange for a publisher to have a wide mix of games and styles in their collection. It was more how the game grew on me the more I played it and the more depth I discovered each play that was the surprise. Well, I wouldn't turn it down if it was the game being played. It's not one I'd ask to play again. 
I do hope, yeah. however, that these designers continue working on games. And I'm interested now in checking out one of the other games from uh, Frigius, uh, which is Cerebria, also from Mind Clash. Yeah, that's a meaty one. We're, we're, we're like over four and a half weight on that one, just to show how different it is from Astra. So if you're into stargazing constellations, or maybe you're into zodiac signs, I, I don't know of many other games with this theme. There are some, but there's not a lot. And it's probably worth checking out Astra just for that region. With its easy to learn mechanics and constantly engaging gameplay, it's probably going to be a hit as a game as well. Similarly, if you know someone who's into these things, this could be a great gift. The rules here are approachable enough that I think even non-hobby gamers should be able to pick it up pretty easily, especially if you have someone who's experienced that can give them a teach. With someone who knows the game teaching you this, you really are playing in minutes. There aren't many games of this weight I'd consider as gifts to a non-hobby gamer, but really as this might be one of them, because while tricky, it's still very approachable. Now, even if the theme does nothing for you, for people like Sean, I suggest seeing if there's a way you can try this game out. There's more going on here than just coloring stars. The actual area majority and reward mechanics are really solid, and the set collection storing is extremely tight, um, to the point of almost being brutal. Indeed, this is not a coloring book game that just happens to be what they chose rather than chits or cubes, and it certainly makes the game easier to pack up as a result. Now, what you're not going to find here is your epic game night filled with back and forth where you're building an engine and making it bigger and better every turn and you're giving yourselves more options and more things to do. You're not going to fight over who gets to do what and you're not trying to save the world. For that kind of experience, check out Mind Clash's other games like Anachrony, Tricurion, or Perseverance. There you have our thoughts on Astra. A good example to me of just how much theme can matter in a game. What's a game that feels like you should enjoy it, but the theme actually turns you off? Tell us about it in the comments below. Now, one final thing before we wrap up this review, and that is to remind you that if you found this helpful, and if you enjoy our content we put out, it would be awesome of you to consider tipping your bellhop over at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Thank you. And now in the bellhop's tabletop, we look back at the games we played since the last episode. All right, so first off, uh, we got a gaming out and about in Windsor with Sean. Uh, no Sean Con this time, it was just a kind of one-day event. Uh, it started with a game of Astra at the Walkerville Brewery. Uh, you just finished hearing me talk about Astra and us talk about Astra. So I, I don't think I have any more to say about Astra. You? Nope, solid game, just not for me. Next up was the first play of Starship Captains for you and Deanna. Um, I know the one thing is both of you were like, wow, that was not what I expected. Yeah, indeed. This one caught me by surprise um, by being an interesting and fun sci-fi game. But with at least only a single play under my belt so far, there was a lot more randomness than I expected from a, a game of this kind of you know origin. Like from, from CGE games, it, it felt more Ameritrash than Euro. And, and that caught me off guard. Yeah. Yeah, I would say for, for their games, this was much closer to, say, Galaxy Trucker than it was, say, Dungeon Lords. Like, this is definitely on their lighter, laugh, kind of have some fun kind of games. But then it's not, because it's all about turn optimization. It, it, it's definitely in an odd place. Mm -hmm. Like, for me, it was my second game, and it played completely different than my first game for the same reason. Because, like you, I wasn't sure what to expect. I, I was expecting more brain burny, thinky, okay, I, I want to make sure, like, the Q thing. I thought I was like, I want to make sure I have a yellow person in there for two turns from now. Maybe you can get there with that game, but that's not what this was. Though I will say now that I knew what to expect and now that I played the game once, man, it was way better. Like it was just, I knew what I was playing and and I, I knew what scored points and I knew what was worth visiting and I, I, I grokked what they were doing with the game and it felt very different and enjoyable. I just only feel bad because I totally crushed the two of you by knowing what to expect. But I think that's going to happen to anyone who plays this game. And I got to say, it's not a good thing for a first play. Like if you play a first game of this with someone who knows what they're doing, they're probably just going to crush you. Yeah, I, I hope that learning the game better and which various options and paths one can take for, uh, towards victory improves it. But I just can't be sure after one play and especially after seeing the impact that one card had on that game like realistically i mean yes you played better and you knew what was going on but that one card that you got that none of us had an option to 
have any sort of equivalent yep. card made a massive difference. <laughs> See, I don't think it did. Like, I, I don't know. Like mm -hmm. your score wasn't that good, but Deanna was two points behind me and didn't repair anything. So that's why I don't think that one card made that much of a difference there. I don't know. Next play, maybe it'll go different. Last game we played together was a learning game of the Artemis project. It was a learning game for you, but it was actually our third play for Deanna and I. And I got to say, I'm, I'm digging the Artemis project. We, we kind of knew we would. Um, we respect Mark and his opinion. He makes good games, but our chat room has also been telling us um, this is what they wanted to see us review next. So we have been playing it and it's solid. I'm, I'm digging this game. Yeah, and while I love the game, as is often my the case, my first game against the two of you, who had both played it previously, was pretty tough. Uh, yeah. As there is a learning curve, and while mastery isn't the right word, just having a more complete knowledge of what's available and what possibilities exist means that it is a tough game to keep up with two other players who already have a bit of knowledge of what's going on. Yeah, no, I totally get it. Like knowing what buildings are worth buying and what you should bid on and what you shouldn't. Um, one of the most interesting things in that game was just how negative it was for events. Like out of the six events we drew, five of them were negative. That's the first time that's happened when I played that game. Usually the events are like happy, like here, bonus, get stuff for free, get free people, get buildings for free. This game was like, if you go here, you're going to lose dice. And if you build that, your people are going to die. And if you go over here, oh, no one's coming off the ship this turn. It was a very different feel that way, which I appreciate. It was cool because it did very much change the feel of the game. One thing that was kind of interesting um, is when we played five player, we played through and I'm playing the game. And I, just knowing how games are generally designed, there is this um, expedition deck. You play five player, you get through it. And then you had to draw two more cards, which just felt wrong. It just felt like in a five player game, you should have perfect information. All these cards are going to come up at some point. It seemed really weird to have, have to shuffle the deck to pull two cards out that you've already seen. That just seemed weird. So after we played that game, I started looking into it. And part of um, we I have the what it, Ganymede version or something. Uh, Galileo, uh, sorry, Galileo, the, the yeah. Galileo edition of the game. Well, the Galileo edition of the game, as well as the Pioneer edition, Comes with a little expansion, um, the alien artifact or something like that. Well, I open that up, and sure enough, here you have two expedition cards. And I gotta say, I'm like, I, I'm not, I'm not gonna call Mark out on this, but it very much felt like that Kickstarter stretch goal that should have just been in the deck from the beginning. Uh, maybe not, but it, it had that feel. But that just made me feel more complete. So now, when I play five players, we're gonna see every card. So I thought that was cool. So I tossed that in. Though I gotta say, with three players, it didn't really matter. But we did see it come up. Yeah, unfortunately, they came up at a at a weird point. Um, yeah, and and that's that's sort of the problem with that expansion is, um, if it comes up at certain points in the game later on in the game, it it kind of doesn't matter and is wasting space. That and that was yeah, that was a little weird for that uh, that expansion. Well, that was that was specifically the event card. The event card. There should be a rule of that event because there's event cards and two expedition cards in that expansion. The event card should be if you draw this on the last turn of the game, ditch it, like throw it out. Because it's putting something out that when you end the round, you might earn a bonus die, but the game's done, so there's no reason for it. So, yeah, that does feel a little off. Um, now, speaking of what just happened here with the with the 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 version we have, I sorry, Mark, but it's annoying. Um, when we reviewed all the bus, we had a problem where we're like, is this the Kickstarter version? Like, we have upgraded coins, and all the pictures show cardboard coins. Is there? Do we have like a a, a special version? And I think with that one. They were like, no, that is the retail version. But if we do a second printing, it won't have the wood. It was a little confusing. The SK, SKU, SKUs, SKUs, whatever you pronounce them, were a little odd. This, I had kind of the same problem. So when I was unboxing it, now I will admit, on the back of the box is something very clear that says what version of the game it is. But it's like a barcode and a, and a I don't know, it says G whatever, something on it, a bunch of numbers. Um, it ends up I have a, a certain backer level that is a Kickstarter exclusive that you can't get unless you back the Kickstarter, which thank you, Mark. That's awesome. My, my copy of Artemis project looks awesome, but the unboxing, I showed off some stuff that the average person's not going to be able to get. So I felt a little bad about that. Yeah. This one was tough as I was editing it for a number of reasons. I mean, we want to correctly represent what we're presenting to our viewers, but we also want to make it clear what people might be able to purchase for themselves. Yeah. We we don't want to say, hey, look at this fancy thing you're never going to see. Ha <laughs> ha. You know, that, right. that's just yeah. not cool. Um, or if we, you know, if we want to show it off, we're going to say, hey, by the way, we were get we, we got this version of it. And this is what the real version is going to look like or something. 
And there right. seem to be a number of different versions. Unfortunately, there are different versions both in retail and from the Kickstarter. Yeah. Which left us scratching our heads how to best identify things and call out what was what. <laughs> yeah, and online game stores didn't help because... They had the description that it was this version, but all the pictures featured the other versions bits. So mm -hmm. I, I I don't know how this gets fixed. I don't know who who the the, the blame lies on figuring it out. Um, but I will say, if you go to Grand Gamers Guild website, there are two versions. You probably want the Pioneer version. I I can't see not wanting to pay the price difference to get that. Plus the retail versions out of print anyway, so you're stuck with the Pioneer version. <laughs> but you're not getting metal badges. Yeah, nothing nothing except another Kickstarter will get you metal expedition badges. Yes. Oh, there. Shout out to Mark from the chat. People, we we we're, Mark's a great guy. And like I said I hate I hate talking bad about him because I, I do love his games and I love his stuff. Just a little confusion on what, what we had, which is like I said, partly on my part because I didn't look at the back of the box and notice the little, you know, the K. Uh, next up for gaming was a day out of town for Deanna and I, uh, which we're just going to stick to the gaming side of things. That started with a two-player learning game of Marrakesh. Um, what I need to start doing is I, I did some unboxings, right? We caught up on, on unboxings. But what I haven't done is caught up on um, punching games. Um, generally, I'm someone who likes to punch. I like the lonely fun of, you know, I sit and I put Netflix on or Disney Plus or whatever. And I sit there and I punch my games and I find baggies of appropriate sizes and I organize everything. The thing is, just we've been busy lately and I just haven't found time to unbox it. And I complained about this last week, how I brought Starship Captains out to a public play event. It had to unbox it. Well, I did it again. And man, it was bad. There were a lot of punch boards in this game. Um, man, like, like we had a hard limit of three hours and we had to spend time punching and didn't finish the game because we spent so long trying to organize everything. Yeah, it was bad. <laughs> well, you know what? Feld is going to Feld. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, this you is had definitely to know. a seven I mean, Feld game. <laughs> you had to know, really. Well, plus I unboxed it. I showed off all those punch boards. It just, it was worse than I thought it would be. And Deanna doesn't like punching, so I felt bad because I forced her to punch some of it so we'd be there less time. Um, See, I do, so I, I do like sitting around. Mo and I have, have, have sat, sat around in the basement oh, with a cup of coffee, sorting and organizing. Uh, Anachrony was second one. Dawn. Yeah, or Second Dawn. Yeah, Second Dawn of the Galaxy. No, was it, was it Anachrony? The, well, we, the done, we, did both of them. we did both of them. We did I, both. I forget which one was the worst, but... Um, but yeah, just, you know, sitting there with these giant Kickstarters and stacks and stacks of cardboard is, can be fun, but that's not how Dee wants to spend her time. <laughs> uh, Deanna in the chat, I'm going to call this one because it's funny. It's like, well, he took the wrong person out for date night. Should have brought Sean <laughs> instead. So anyway, we, we finally get the dang thing punched, right? And, and, and wow, is this a table hog? Okay. Like, like ridiculous table hog. The personal player boards you have. In addition to like this thing that slots at the top and then these tiles you have to track are bigger than game boards I own, like like the game boards that players share. And then you still have a massive game board and that game board is huge, really is just there to hold stuff except for two tracks and the two tracks could have been smaller. And I totally understand why there's now a new edition of Marrakesh in a smaller box that condenses everything because holy cow, does this take up a lot of time, a uh, room. Story room. Then I've told people I'm kind of intimidated by this game, right? Huge, thick rule book, color coded sections. And I'm like, what the heck? It's like there's 12 different things you can do, 12 different places you can go. You know what? There are. There's 12 different things you can do in 12 different places you can go. But honestly, it wasn't bad. It's intimidating. It looks scary. But once you're actually teaching it, I was extremely reminded of Terra Mystica. Terra Mystica is the game I hate to teach because it scares people. But once you start teaching, it just makes sense. Like in Terra Mystica, there's 13 different things to do. But each of those 13 different things is so simple that overall it's easy to teach. This was like that. It was like, okay, if you do a green action, you get a fig for every green dude there. Done. Like that's it. Now, if you do with this action, like there's some complicated ones. Like in particular, the the when you get the guards, you then put like gates out in special places and there's some special scoring. But like the blue area, which is fishing, well, move your boat up as many spaces as catchies you have in blue. Like, that's it. It's it's actually that easy. And I've got to say, this is a really easy game to pick up and teach for the base mechanics. 
Yeah, that's, I, I think this one scared a lot of people, and I can see why, visually. Uh, yes. <laughs> it's, you know, the game is intimidating. Anyone who sees this, sees the rule book, sees the table space, is going to get nervous. And it's good to know that it's just not as bad as it looks. I don't know how oh. you can get that across to people without them watching <laughs> our, our discussions yes. of it. But uh, it's good to know. Yeah, it's, it's it's very much the meme of I'm, I'm about to describe a meme in in, in voice again of, of like the, the 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 board game person teaching the group. No, it's not as hard as you think, right? It really is though. It really isn't. Like it's the cashies. There's 12 different colors of them, and you get like 40 of each one, and you just put those out on a table. And then there's three different resources. So the actual game, I'm I'm gonna skip the theme of the town of Marrakesh and everything you're doing. I'm just going to talk about things by color. It's Steffenfeld. It's got a theme. The theme, I'm sure, makes some sense for some of the things you're doing, but really it's an abstract game. And what you're doing is you have, there's 12 different areas of the board that each do different things. And you have a little colored, uh, they call them Keshi, little colored cylinder in each of those colors. Well, you're going to pick three of those and put them out in your hand. And then you're, all your opponents are going to do the same. You reveal them. Those are the three actions you're going to take that turn. Then you're going to grab everyone's cashies and drop them in the cube tower. Everyone knows how much I love cube towers. Then you're going to group them by the colors that fell out. And then people are going to draft the cashies. Well, the cashies then go into the spots. Note, they don't have to match the spots you put your workers. What the cashies do is they make those individual actions better. So if you have white cashies, that puts you up the white track while you go up the number of white cashies that are in your track. So once everyone's placed their cashies, you then activate your workers in any order you want. And again, there's all kinds of things. You're exploring the Sahara and you're getting end game scoring. You're moving up your fishermen to get points at the end of every round, points or resources. You're putting guards. You're going up two different tracks. There's a bunch of things. It's a, it's a Steffenfeld. It is, it is by definition a point salad. Like if I say it's a Steffenfeld game, but the basic mechanics are that you sit there, you Put out a bunch of cashies. Those are your three actions you're going to do. Drop them in the cube tower, then kind of level up your different abilities. The interesting part is there's the, the, the perfect information of in a season, and you play three seasons, you are going to take every action once and only once because you only have 12 cashies, one of each color. And that's basically how to play. And, and then you're just going to add up your points at the end. It's really not that bad. Listening to that, I can only think of two things. One is... Keshis and Keshas are very different things. And two, <laughs> the closed captioning on this video is not going to be fun. <laughs> yeah, I don't doubt it. it, it I, I don't know. Keshis, it is because it's Amerikesh. I, it worked. You know what? We used it. Everyone said it. It caught on quickly in our gameplay. So what happened, though, is we're, we're doing this, right? We're playing one season. Oh, my gosh. Did we play? We played double extra extreme. We, we made up our own game. Um, so what we did is we, we revealed our, our cashies and then we put them in the cube tower and then we saw what came out. Then we put our workers out, which you can kind of see why that doesn't work already. <laughs> um, for one, you could base it on what was out and you're like, Ooh, I can get two cashies of that and I'll get a good action. But more importantly, uh, it let us take the same action multiple times this way. And while by the end of the first turn, Deanna had collected scrolls, they're called, that give you in-game abilities and had it set up so every time she went up either track, she got like eight things. Like it was a fantastic combo and it seemed really cool until we realized that, oh, <laughs> you would have been able to collect a max of three of those and in the entire game and in the first season you had four. So yeah. And meanwhile, I had a thing going on where I was collecting luxury goods that also looked like, again, it looked like we were going to be competitive. Like she had her, her track strategy and I had my luxury goods strategy going, but no, that wasn't Marrakesh. We, we made up our own game. Like it, <laughs> it was that bad. It was one of the most extreme plays I have ever done. Bellhop's law in effect, your first game of any play is going to be extreme. No matter what, no matter how many videos you watch, no matter how many times you read the rules, no matter how much you think, you know, the game, you're going to miss something. Fair enough. That's uh, unfortunate, but uh, it is common enough. Uh, we always say you should play some and stop and then restart during learning yep. games. But to be honest, we're not usually really good at listening to our own advice there. So, yeah, uh, in this case, we did. Now, it didn't help that the place was also closing, but we knew we weren't going to fit in a full game. So literally, we explored. Yeah, and Deanna's clarifying. I wasn't going to get into the details. Technically, your red cashy lets you go somewhere twice. So at most, you could do two. 
So, yes, I guess by the end of the game, you could have collected all those scrolls as long as you used your red at least twice to go back to, um, I think it's the market, wherever it is you go to get the scrolls. I, I, with clerics, I think you're using clerics to get scrolls. This is where the game's going to fall down a bit is is I don't even try to figure out scholars. There you go. See, I, I did the I did the Sean playing Lords of Waterdeep thing. I'm like, give me a white Keshi. Give me a red. Um, for some reason, reds were water sellers. Water seller that felt. stuck in my head. <laughs> yeah. Water seller stuck in my head. I, w- I was all good with that one. And reds were water sellers. Blue, I think I called boats, even though they're fishermen. I don't know. doesn't matter. All right. So. From there, we went over to um, Bandit Goose. One of the reasons we were in the county is their mug club thing. Mug club social happens the last Sunday of the month. Um, I've been trying to talk less about local events, but I will say what was neat here compared to the last one is the place was packed uh, to the fact that like when people walked in, they were like, are you part of mug club? Nope. Sorry. You'll have to come back. Um, Try again in an hour. Hopefully some people will have left. Um, While enjoying some crap beers, I did teach Deanna to play Mind Your Business. Um, I did not, unfortunately, bring games to play with other people this time because I was expecting the same thing as last time. Uh, we played two rounds of this. This is a gnome mining game where you uh, have a grid of cards and the cards show mine paths on them, like mine, mine oh. cards. Not, there's no tracks. Mines of three different resources, gold, gems, and coal. And they like curve, right? Like kind of kind of think Sorrow tiles, right? Not, they're not, there's only one path on each one, though, or three or four. I'm describing this absolutely terribly. So <laughs> you you have a grid out. Um, I think it was four by four. It might have been more, and I don't even remember now. Six by six, whatever. There's a grid of cards, and you've got a mine cart that starts in the first square, and you got a gnome, and every turn you take three actions with your gnome, which is like move orthogonally, turn the card you're on, swap it with another card. And your goal is to make a string of a resource going through the mine on these paths to your mine cart. Now, one of the actions is to actually load your cart. So you generally would take one or two or three actions, then load your cart, and then it, it moves along. Really neat game. Um, it's the, the 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 fun part about this one that, that just made me happy is, like, I got that less of a description when I first was shown the game at Origins. I was like, this is what, what I expected the game to be. Like, it was literally exactly what I thought I'd get. Like, uh, no surprises here. No Oh, wow. That's not how I, this is deeper than I thought. None of that. This, this was simple to learn, uh, but actually quite thinky. Um, the one thing I guess there, here's the one surprise turns took longer than I expected. Like this was a Deanna's like, yeah, go to the washroom. So I have time to think now this is no medium weight Euro. It's no Stefan Feld. We're, we're no Marrakesh here, but it's way more than just a quick playing party game or filler game. Now, the problem we had with this, though, is contrast. This is another Kickstarter game that I very strongly feel someone did their graphic design in Photoshop or whatever, and it looked awesome on their screen, and they did not get a test print before sending it to their printer. The cards here, the backs, which thankfully during gameplay don't actually matter, the backs are some of the worst cards I've ever seen. There is literally a teleport card that I can't tell with the images on the back. There's like a wheel. The animated snow is it looks like maybe there's a disappearing gnome. So that would make sense for teleport. But I have no idea what else is on the card. Um, the, the food card kind of looks like a pizza, I guess. It, the contrast is terrible. Plus, there's at least one card in the game where one of the things they did was there's these paths of gems. But they also put lines to show the edges of the mine. There's a card they forgot the lines. And we actually missed that there was coal even on that card at first until picking it up. Then there's cards that if you end your turn on them have signs and you get to read the sign and do what it says. These are in a terrible font and in a light kind of tannish color that just blends in with the red background. Like this game is kind of a graphic design nightmare. Yeah, this was really bad. And on top of the bad font, and contrast on those signs they're also at an angle like it's it, it, like like they're signs that you're kind of peering down at so you're not looking at yes. them straight on you're seeing them at a sort of isometric sort of angle which just makes the contrast and the font readability even yeah. worse um like it was so bad that i they sent me pictures and it's a four by four grid yeah. by the way um <laughs> check the pictures um 
even on pictures where the camera is doing its best to make things look good and it's enhancing contrast and things, it yeah. was still obvious how bad this was. Um, yeah, Sean was joking. He's like, this is a game you have to play through your camera. Because <laughs> yeah. at least you could read you could read the signs a little bit better. The, 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 the camera, you know, Google, Google lens or lens or whatever helped pop the contrast on the signs and make them yeah. more readable. But yeah, it was it was unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, and it's bad because the game's actually pretty solid. Like I, I knew what I was getting. I, I, this is not a groundbreaking, fantastic game that, that that everyone should rush out and buy. This is a game that is going to be fantastic for our public play events. Now I bought two copies of it, and they're slightly different because they have different colored meeples in them, but otherwise they're identical. So you can play up to four players, and this is going to be a barbershop bar staple. I bet I'm going to have it there. And when people are like, oh, "I'm looking for a game, but I don't know what I like," and I'm like, "This is so approachable." Like. Here's your grid. Here's the three things you can do. All you're trying to do is line up a pattern so the stuff gets loaded in your mind card. That basic concept everyone is going to get. And they're going to jump in it thinking it's nice and simple, but then they're going to realize, they're like, wait a minute, I'm not having enough time to learn. Oh, what I need to start doing is being more strategic and setting up stuff so that in three turns, I can do a nice big six load on my cart. But then I got to hope my opponent, right? Like there's just more there. But the basic mechanics, like I could probably teach a toddler and they'll be able to score at least one or two every turn. Like it is just that simple for the, the core system of the game. So I'm so disappointed that that contrast, like I hope they do a second printing and do something to up that brightness. It's interesting. Now I do know that there are print and play versions of this. So I wonder if you print your own, if you yeah. get a better, uh, a better looking version. Yeah. Uh, PNP Arcade possibly. has versions of this game. That is possible. Or if you get them to print it, maybe it'd come better than the production copy. I don't know. All right. So we, we, we played a couple games of Mind Your Business, something relatively light. But the big thing we kept saying was like, man, I, I, I want to play Marrakesh. And like Dan's like, really? You want to get sit back down? Like, like, yeah, yeah. So then we rearranged the rest of our evening to try to find a way to get in a full game of Marrakesh, thinking it's going to take us three hours. It's, 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 it's a two-hour game. And honestly, that seems like a good time. We're going to, we, we need somewhere we can go for three hours. And unfortunately, coffee shops and bars and pubs and everything on Sunday that has public play um, and Tim Horton tables wouldn't have been big enough. We were like, man, we got to try to find somewhere. So we eventually figured out a place to go. And we went to um, the, uh, the upstairs at the Sandwich Brewery, which was open. And, and we went and it was good. Uh, unfortunately, the light there is worse than I thought. Now, I remembered it being brighter upstairs and downstairs, and it is. The problem was the lights upstairs were very yellow and um, the Marrakesh, because it has 12 colors, I honestly don't think they did any color blindness testing at all with this game. I would be surprised if they did. With that yellow light, there were three colors of Keshis you could not tell apart. Two that were so bad that I had to use my camera light to see what color they were. Now, I will say in that game, it doesn't matter that often because when you collect the Keshis, you put them on an area of your board that's color coded. And partway through the game, we realized that Deanna had a yellow in her tan, but that didn't matter. But it was when we were dropping them from the tower. If you happen to have a yellow, tan and brown come out at once or white, sorry, white, yellow and tan come out at once. We had to like grab our camera and then the black, brown and purple, the purple and black. I couldn't tell apart. Deanna couldn't tell apart the purple and the brown without, like I said, additional light. Now I gotta say that venue, I still want to host a game night, but I want to do an afternoon one because there's these nice big bay windows. And I think with natural sunlight, it'd be great, but not a great gaming space as I thought it would be. Tables are nice and big. Yeah. Venues nice tables nice, are but... really important, especially for games like that. But sadly, yeah, this easily fit with room. We were able to put our charcuterie spread on the same table as Marrakesh. So <laughs> But sadly, so is lighting. And yellow does not help a sort of eastern sandstone looking game come through yeah. all that well. No, I agree. Now, on the positive side, even trying to squeeze and use our camera lights, uh, we finished a full game under two hours, which, is, which I got to say is pretty good. Uh, I would still very much call this a learning game. Um, the game itself, like Gary kind of covered it and you already know it, it's very much a Feld. Uh, it's very much point salad, but you know what? It's good. It's, it's, it, it gave me my Feld joy. Um, I am a Feld fanboy. So is my wife. 
So caveat there, if you don't enjoy Felds, you may feel completely sim- similar, but man, oh, this was good. This was, I haven't had that feeling in a long time. I think the last time I, I had that much joy of like, just, oh yeah, this, this is what I wanted. This is what I needed. This is what I hungered for was probably Trajan. So this was a, a ton to think about, but not too much. Um, a ton of player agency. You had a lot of control over what you were doing all without being overwhelming. Like it sure looks like it should scare the heck out of you, but it wasn't that bad. And like Deanna noted something like the best game she's played in a long time. Like of all the stuff we reviewed recently, this is up there. So watch out folks as Deanna loves her heavyweight game. So if it's one of her faves, it's going to be a thinker of a game. Yep. True enough. Um, now at this point, I, I want to play more, right? So, so one of the big ones is I want Sean to play because I know you're not the failed fan we are. So it'll be interesting to see what you think of this one. Yeah, because I have been skewing more towards heavy games. I really yeah. have been and been finding that that the enjoyment in the weighty uh, game. So I'm interested to see what I think as well. I, now, I don't think that I'm quite up there with D for the, you know, calculus, the board game. But <laughs> I have yeah. often been enjoying the weightier stuff as opposed to light fillers. So um, last one to talk about that wasn't in our show notes yesterday, but I had to toss in today is that I did the good and responsible reviewer thing and made sure to sit down and try Tome the Light Edition with two players before our review tonight. And um, I was shocked. Uh, it, it's good. It works. It's it's perfectly fine. I was expecting this to feel like the two three player experience and be pretty much purely random, but not a lot of and, and not much fun. Right. With no player agency. And it wasn't that at all. Um, it had the good two player cutthroat feel, right? The, the man, every trick, every card play, there was never a round where it was like, well, okay, maybe the last round, the last hand, when you're like, all you got left is a three and a two in your hand. But in general, it was, it was, it was very thinky. Um, well, adding in a random element that's not there in the four player game because of the fact that at the start of the round and every round, you're adding a new card to your hand. Um, I actually think, Sean, you might have really liked this mode because it stops that that whole whoever's counting cards wins. It removes the card counting aspect whatsoever because now there's no way you're going to count all the cards. Like, yes, okay, maybe that last hand, you might have a pretty good deal, uh, idea of what everyone has, but like because of the random elements, you don't get that same thing you get with the full four-player version where on that last hand, you should know what the other three cards the other players have. Not necessarily who has what, but at least what cards are out there. That's gone. The only way I would have been able to play it against your dad, more than likely. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Like, like you can actually get to do that. As for what's next, um, well, the goal is the three of us to get together this weekend, I don't know, one or two days, or when we'll figure it out, and hammer out plays of Seas of Havoc. I uh, want to do a three-player game, just D, Sean, and I. And then hopefully rope Gwen into playing a four player team game with us. Um, and we need Sean to play a full game of distilled. We came so close once. Just want to get Sean so we can share a full opinion of the game when we do review it. And then if there's time left, maybe some play some other stuff as well, because I'm sure D wouldn't argue if we threw Marrakesh down on the table again. Do we have a table at your house big enough for a game of Marrakesh? <laughs> Uh, it should fit on the kitchen table. I think so. Our, our kitchen table is not tiny. It, it fits five of us for dinner. So we should we should be able to get it to fit. Um, if it doesn't, we'll have to grab some TV trays to maybe hold the uh, the cashies to the side or the, the no, actually the cube tower on a TV tray sounds terrible. <laughs> um, that should have us ready to review Seas of Havoc and Distilled next week, which is their plan. That 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 is 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 our plan for next week. Look at that plan ahead. Which will go perfectly with our topic of, I, I have no idea. I, I'm i not that playing that far ahead. Um, I will say we're not going to be talking about miniatures and board games for the third week in a row. And to be fair, Mo said that, uh, you know, it wasn't in his, uh, wasn't in the notes yesterday for the, the you know, what happened with uh, two, two player. Yeah, that's because we didn't have any notes tomorrow. Don't lie. <laughs> yesterday. Oh, yeah, oh. yeah that's true. <laughs> There weren't notes yesterday. <laughs> Sorry, earlier today. <laughs> it's earlier today. I, did, I actually had it in there saying only buy this game if you're playing four player. And I'm like, I had to change it. So I'm I'm very glad I tried it. I, I feel I feel like I did the right thing. I would have felt bad saying don't play this game at two player because it's it's not bad at all. Before we start locking things down, let's take a moment and thank a selection of our tabletop bellhop Patreon patrons. Their support helps keep this show going. Brian Sheehan, 
Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Dukas. Ron F. Thank you, Ron. Roger Malash. Good to see you out in the Berg. David Miller Jr. Thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock the lobby doors. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com and all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice as the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Uh, keep the conversation going. Join us at the Tabletop Bellhop Discord. That's over at discord.tabletopbellhop.com. Well, that's all for us tonight. If you enjoy our content, leave a review, a comment, or a like wherever you find it. Drop by YouTube and try a totally free subscription. <laughs> for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.